Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us on this COVID-19 media briefing. My name is Noraida Negron, Communication Administrator. We started sharing information this morning with our Emergency Management Coordinator and Laredo Fire Chief, Mr. Guillermo Hurd. Good afternoon, everybody. Buenas tardes a todos. Um, well, as we continue to plan uh, the different uh, areas of concern uh, with this COVID pandemic, I, I do know that one of the biggest concerns is the schools and there's been different efforts uh, within our EOC with the health authority, our, our city leaders and our health director to help mitigate this um, possible areas uh, to prevent the spread. Uh, and a lot of them have to do with the mass mandates and we'll have more information on that later as the week transpires. Uh, we are also working on on the backside with the schools too uh, diligently and they've been very cooperative with us and and they have wonderful plans too but we are also making suggestions too to help improve their own plans currently um, we are also preparing in case we get more pediatric patients in our community uh, also with the on the outpatient uh, at part and the inpatient so on the outpatient i mean having more access to them if they get co kids that are COVID positive before they become severely ill we are wake, working with our uh, partners such as Gateway in, in a way for they could provide more immediate testing, immediate care for them, because we do know earlier testing has a better prognosis too. And then also on the backside, we are working with the hospitals to help uh, prepare in case we do have a surge of moderate to severely ill kids in our community. And when we're unable to transfer them out, because as we, as you all know, when we've said it, uh, we've been saying this for many weeks now, we don't have a pediatric ICU in our community. Uh, we've said, uh, we've met several times with, between the, the city, the county and our hospital partners in, all, in order to help mitigate this. And, and we, there's different plans being processed as we speak. Um, currently, the hospitals right now do have a high census between the 4 of them of 91 COVID patients uh, and 26 of those are vented. Unfortunately, we are seeing that most uh, a lot more of them are on the younger side. Unfortunately. And, but we, we still have several events uh, available in our community, over 58, if need to be deployed in any of those areas to help support this patient's care. Uh, there, we do know that the vaccination is one of the biggest tool we have to fight against this pandemic. Uh, there's several been several news in the last week about the booster for the immunocompromised and also the eighth month. After you get your second dose, the eighth month, third dose. Uh, we are planning here uh, within the city to help how, how to provide that within our community. Fortunately, now, uh, during this time, more providers, more, more pharmacists, more doctors have the vaccination. So it would be a lot easier to provide that third dose. Uh, we do have dishes contractors and also the National Guard here. So in the coming weeks, we will have more information on where you can get that third uh, shot when it is indicated. Ahora en español. Uh, seguimos com uh, comunicando entre la ciudad. Uh, nas tenemos uh, muchas juntas entre semana con las escuelas, los hospitales, en, en la ciudad. Y estamos coordinando nos, uh, las diferentes áreas que pueden causar, que están causando más, más uh, nervio en, en esto, en la pandemia de COVID. Ahorita con las escuelas, uh, estamos hablando con ellos uh, dos a tres veces por semana y con sus planes y también estamos dando recomendaciones recomendaciones para que eh, para pa tratar de bajar la, la infección entre las escuelas porque sabemos que ahorita las escuelas públicas acaban de abrir eh, esta es la segunda semana y las privadas la tercera semana so sí estamos mirando que hay más casos so en en eso también estamos preparando con los hospitales también para soportarlos a ellos en caso que ganemos Más, más pacientes, especialmente niños que sean positivos y que necesitan que estar que están uh, tratados en el hospital. También estamos tratando de hablar, uh, estamos hablando con las uh, clínicas, especialmente Gateway, para tener planes para darle más uh, tratamiento a los pacientes que no sean muy que no sean muy malos o enfermos que te, que pueden ir a una clínica a pagar el tratamiento temprano. El centro de infusión que habló que abrió el viernes uh, ha dado 102 infusiones a medicina en nuestra comunidad. Uh, la mayoría de esas infusiones han sido walk-ins, so, son gente que tienen el resultado positivo 
pero no tienen doctor, o so van a la, van a la, a la centro de fusión, ahí va un médico y si ellos califican, ganan el tratamiento. Sabemos que este tratamiento es muy efectivo y ha estado, está aquí otra vez por el estado y le decimos a la gente, si tienen un resultado positivo, vayan con su doctor o si no tienen un doctor, vayan, a la, vayan allá a la, a la, a la centro de fusión para ganar el tratamiento. Seguimos uh, coordinando con los vac las vacina los vacunas. Um, ahorita sabemos que ese es el mejor, uh, el mejor, es, es el mejor uh, para el combate contra la pandemia. Um, sabemos que ha visto muchas noticias en nuestras últimas semanas diciendo del el dosis es tercero. Uh, estamos coordinando con uh, el National Guard y con el Estado para dar este tercer dosis para la comunidad en, cuando ya comiencen a, a recibir lo que va a ser ya en los últimos de, sep, de septiembre, cuando uh, mucha de la comunidad ya va a estar uh, listo para ganar esa tercera dosis. Uh, y with that, uh, that's my report for the COVID, but I will add one last thing. This is not COVID related. There is a disturbance that is building in the Gulf. Uh, as of now, it does show that it might affect Mexico, North Mexico and Texas as the weeks, as the days progress, we are actively monitoring it. And if, if it is going to affect South Texas, we'll be make sure to advise the public, but we are at the EOC continuously monitoring that and also the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Heard, for your report. Now we hear from Laredo's health department, Mr. Richard Chamberlain. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Noraida. I wanted to give a little bit of, of a background and an update regarding our current stats of infections in the community. Um, as of May, or from May 2021, we did have a total of 344 new infections that were reported. For June, we reported 421 infections, so we did see an increase from May to June. At the end of June, we did identify, as we've shared in the past, the alpha variant being present within our community. And of course, now we do know that there's alpha um, Delta and sorry, we did mention at the end of June that there was a Delta variant that was identified at the end of June. Um, but now we do know that we have Alpha, Delta and Gamma within our community. So in July, we did shoot up basically, um, 300% to 2,063 cases. And now and as of Monday on August, we have, we are reporting 2,408 cases. So we continue to see this rapid acceleration of cases. Um, we are still very much concerned. We have seen and observed forecasts that have put us um, at an apex for infections the, the first, second, and third week of September. So there's still a lot of new infections that are likely to occur, but this is all preventable um, with vaccine and um, using face masks in your indoor environment. So what I'd like to share is that recovery of the nation from the COVID-19 pandemic requires a combined effort of families friends and neighbors working together in a unified public health action. I understand wearing a mask can be uncomfortable, particularly for large periods of time in the Laredo heat, but covering your and covering your nose and mouth may hinder verbal and nonverbal communication, particularly for children and um, for deaf individuals. But community mask wearing substantially reduces the COVID-19 um, infection, especially in unvaccinated populations. The overall benefit of wearing a mask derives from their combined ability to limit both exhalation and inhalation of, of infectious virus. We remind the community there is still a large population of unvaccinated persons, primarily 0 to 12 are young. Keeping them safe for each other and from each other by using a mask will help prevent countless infections and hospitalizations. We also want to remind the community if you are sick, stay home. If your child is sick, Please keep them home and allow them to recover. For everyone over the age of 12, vaccine is available. Use a face mask in crowded indoor air environments, and when you choose vaccine, you choose to save lives. La recuperación de, de la nación en cuanto a la pandemia de COVID-19 se requieren esfuerzos combinados de familias, amigos y vecinos que trabajan juntos para la, ciudad, la salud pública. Entiendo que el, usa, el usar de máscara puede ser incómodo, particularmente durante periodos prolongados bajo las temperaturas calientes de Laredo. 
y cubrirse la nariz y la boca puede impedir la comunicación verbal, particularmente para los niños y personas con impedimentos. Pero el uso de mascarillas comunitarias reduce la transmisión de COVID-19, especialmente en poblaciones no vacunadas. Recordamos a la comunidad que todavía hay una gran población de personas no vacunadas, principalmente los de 0 a 12 años de edad. Mantenerlo seguro el, el uno al otro mediante el uso de una máscara ayudará a prevenir inf infecciones y hospitalizaciones. También queremos recordar a la comunidad que si está enfermo, quédese en casa. Si su hijo está enfermo, déjalo en casa para recuperarse. Para todas las personas mayores de 12 años, la vacuna está disponible. Usa una máscara en ambientes interiores y cuando elegible vacunarse, vacunarse está salvando vidas. I'll pause for questions. Thank you, Norada. Thank you so much, Mr. Chamberlain, for your report. Now we hear from Laredo's Health Authority, Dr. Victor Trevino. Good morning, Dr. Victor Trevino, Health Authority for the city of Laredo. We're reporting more deaths and our sincere condolences to the families of those that we have lost. Yesterday, we reported 87 COVID hospitalizations with a 21.2% hospitalization rate. The hospitals are currently over 90 admissions with patients waiting also in the ER overflow. The acuity of the hospitals still remains very high. So a lot of patients that would normally be sent for observation at the hospitals are being treated as outpatients through our local clinics. Now, this does have an impact on the treatment of other illnesses in our community. Knowing this, we're going to see this occur among our unvaccinated populations, as we have seen. And we are reinforcing our efforts to get people vaccinated because when individuals get sick from a preventable disease, it does put stress on our medical resources. We're also specifically addressing enhancing vaccination policies among medical staff and hospitals. Because of their close interaction with patients, medical personnel are in a unique position of trust and they must do everything they can to safeguard their patients and themselves from vaccine preventable diseases such as COVID-19. We're constantly meeting with the hospitals to continue with these discussions. Now on the school front, with regards to children, the amount of pediatric patients in our local clinics has increased. I see it in my clinic every day. And from speaking to local practitioners and pediatricians over the weekend, they're treating a higher volume of children with COVID. And this is supported by data supplied by the health department showing that pediatric cases have jumped from 27% in May to nearly 35% now, and also trending up. Now, currently, the cumulative data from earlier waves in the pandemic shows that children fare better from, with COVID-19 than adults. However, the Delta variant is giving us more data points, and we're seeing that more children are getting infected and sicker. Now, there are opinions from some that the percentage of child deaths is still very low. And my answer to that is that what does it say about us if we're willing to risk preventable deaths of children because it's only a small percentage? I do not agree with that. Especially when we know that the data from Hispanic children are eight times more likely to be hospitalized than, and we don't have a pediatric intensive care unit, as we have said. We will be meeting this afternoon for more information to follow. Now on the issue of emergency pediatric efforts, we did meet with our short-term plan of bringing a pediatric team and our long-term plans to invest uh, to be more productive about medically underserved needs. We have another meeting this Friday, but a plan and discussions will be made to address these critical issues affecting our community. Not in Espanol. Buenos días, Dr. Victor Treviño, Autoridad de Salud de la Ciudad de Laredo. Nos encontramos reportando más muer muertes y nuestro más sentido pésame a las familias de aquellos que hemos perdido. Ayer informamos 87 hospitalizaciones por COVID con una tasa de hospitalización de 21.2%. Y los hospitales tienen actualmente más de 90 ingresos con pacientes esperando en emergencias. También, la agudeza en los hospitales sigue siendo muy alta. 
por lo que muchos pacientes que normalmente serían enviados para observación y admisión en los hospitales están siendo tratados como pacientes ambulatorios a través de nuestras clínicas locales. Y esto tiene un impacto en el tratamiento de otras enfermedades en nuestra comunidad. Sabiendo esto, seguimos viendo muertes en nuestra población no vacunada y estamos reforzando nuestros esfuerzos para vacunar a las personas porque cuando las personas se enferman con una enfermedad prevenible, esto ejerce presión sobre nuestro, nuestros recursos médicos. También estamos abordando específicamente la mejora, de, la mejora de políticas de vacunación entre personal médico de los hospitales. Y debido a sus interacciones cercanas con pacientes, el personal médico se encuentra en una posición única de confianza y debe de hacer todo lo posible para proteger a sus pacientes y a ellos mismos de enfermedades prevenibles como la vacunación por la vacunación y como enfermedades de COVID-19. Ahora, constantemente nos reunimos con los hospitales para continuar con estas discusiones. Y en el, en el ambiente escolar, en lo que respecta a los niños, hay aumentado, ha aumentado la cantidad de pacientes pediátricos en nuestras clínicas locales. Lo que lo veo en mi clínica todos los días y al hablar con médicos uh, y pediatras locales durante el fin de semana, tratan un mayor de volumen de niños con COVID por la consulta externa. Esto está respaldado por los datos proporcionados por el Departamento de Salud que muestran que los casos pediátricos han aumentado del 27% en mayo a casi el 35% ahora y tienen una, tencia, una tendencia a seguir subiendo. Actualmente los datos acumulados de oleadas anteriores de la pandemia muestran que los niños se veían mejor con la enfermedad de COVID-19 en comparación con los adultos. Pero sin embargo, la variante Delta nos está dando más puntos y datos y estamos viendo que los niños se infectan y se enferman más. Ahora, las opiniones de algunos de que el porcentaje de muertes infantiles sigue siendo muy baja. Mi respuesta a esto, ¿qué dice esto acerca de, nuestros, de nosotros si estamos dispuestos a arriesgarnos a muertes prevenibles de niños porque solo un pequeño porcentaje se afecta. No estoy de acuerdo con eso. Y especialmente cuando sabemos que por los datos que los niños hispanos tienen ocho veces más probabilidades de ser hospitalizados y no tenemos un, una unidad de cuidado intensivo pediátrica. También sabemos el tema de nuestros esfuerzos pediátricos de emergencia. Nuestros, y nos estamos reuniendo en nuestro plan de corto plazo de traer un equipo pediátrico y nuestros planes a largo plazo es para invertir y ser más proactivos sobre nuestras necesidades médicamente desatendidas que hemos tenido por mucho tiempo. Tenemos otra reunión este viernes, pero se tomarán decisiones y un plan para abordar estos problemas críticos que nos afectan a nuestra comunidad. Este es mi reporte. Gracias. Thank you, Dr. Trevino, for your report. Our Mayor Pete Sainz and our City Manager, Mr. Robert Eads, are on the line for any questions, and we do have a few questions here on our chat. The first one comes from Judith Rayo, and it reads, ¿Pueden dar más información sobre la junta que tuvieron para discutir la unidad pediátrica? ¿Qué fue lo que se, eh, se decidió? Ambos idiomas, por favor. Maybe, Mayor, you, you want to start with that one. Sí, buenas tardes, Judith. Bueno, yeah, buenos días, perdón. Uh, sí, tuvimos la reunión ahí en el aeropuerto. Uh, varios miembros estaban con nosotros, el doctor Treviño, su servidor, uh, uh, los, los gerentes de los hospitales uh, mayores, que sería Emma Montes, y también uh, representando a Jorge Elial, era el señor uh, Reyes. Rogelio Reyes y, y el doctor Cigarro ha estado con nosotros, otros, y otros doctores, Milton Haber, Gladys King, Luis Benavides, uh, el doctor Garza Góngora, uh, la doctora Claire Cigarroa y doctor Marta Martínez, y estaba también la regidora Lisa Cigarroa. Uh, lo, la discusión principalmente fue sobre uh, el sistema pediátrico aquí en, en Laredo, la falta de ese sistema. 
Ah, nos avisaron también ahí en la reunión que el Estado de Texas no pensaba mandar más recursos eh, de personal dentro de las siguientes dos, tres semanas o a lo mejor hasta más tiempo. Ah, eso nos alarmó. Ah, también el, y nos estamos escuchando, ya, ya tenemos varios días, ah, de que va subiendo. El Apex espera en la, probablemente la primera o segunda semana de septiembre. Y eso también va a indicar que a lo mejor otras ciudades en el estado van a encontrarse con el mismo problema, que, que no podemos trasladar a otros lugares. A, y eso nos está forzando a crear un, un plan inmediato sobre el, el sistema pediátrico aquí en la Aero Texas. A, y, y, lo, y los términos se los dejo al doctor Treviño a, porque es algo más en el área médica. Pero el, el plan fue de, de que los CEOs de los hospitales uh, regresen el viernes a las 10 de la mañana y en el aeropuerto también para re, reunirnos otra vez y, y que nos presenten ese plan. Uh, también se discutió la, la importancia de contratar un consultor uh, para un plan largo, uh, que nos, uh, conseguirlo para empezar mente y que nos uh, proponga a la, a la comunidad, que es el plan uh, largo de, de nuestras necesidades, cómo satisfacer esas necesidades. Y, y, se, y se decidió que tiene que ser una persona, un grupo, una persona probablemente muy independiente, uh, porque todos reconocemos que hay intereses personales, privados, uh, uh, más uh, con las clínicas, los hospitales, cosas de esas, tendría que ser algo muy objetivo, uh, muy independiente, muy, uh, muy uh, y no imparcial. Uh, y ese es el objetivo de nosotros de, de conseguir esta persona. Y, uh, y sobre los pagos del consultor, uh, la ciudad está, está dispuesta, tenemos que obtener la aprobación del, del concilio y también el condado tiene que obtener la, la aprobación del Commissioner's Court, pero pensamos irnos mit y mit uh, si es posible. Y, uh, y con eso fue prácticamente los puntos. Uh, le pido al doctor Treviño también si gusta uh, comentar sobre los puntos médicos del sistema este. Sí, gracias, uh, Mayor. Mire, básicamente lo que, lo que hemos visto es por la situación desatendida que hemos tenido aquí en Laredo, en nuestra comunidad, por muchas décadas. La pandemia nos enseñó y lo trajo luz más fuertemente. Y sobre todo hemos visto que no tenemos áreas para atender una gran cantidad de niños enfermos en una forma repentina, que es lo que está produciendo esta pandemia. Uh, aunque estamos haciendo planes a corto plazo y los planes a corto plazo es primeramente crear una área donde se puedan uh, detener estos niños en caso de que ya no haya habilidad de trasladarlos a otros lugares. Uh, tenemos que tener también equipo pediátrico también para ver si en un momento dado tenemos que ingresar estos niños a los hospitales locales y este equipo médico son son personal altamente entrenado para cuidado intensivo pediátrico. Y esta situación tiene que ser dirigida rápidamente para un plan de corto plazo y también para seguir con este plan, porque no solamente la pandemia nos va a dar estas situaciones, puede haber enfermedades de otro tipo y para una población de nuestro tamaño ya es necesario tener este tipo de cuidado intensivo pediátrico. Sí, es que todos estos puntos se, va, se van a discutir más a fondo este viernes cuando tengamos la junta, pero sí, claro, los puntos médicos y la necesidad, el por qué médicamente se necesita esto, también van a ser discutidos. Pero definitivamente este es un, un uh, tópico de mucha importancia y tiene que ser uh, dirigido para un plan rápido, a corto plazo y un plan que continúe a largo plazo. Dr. Treviño, can you also repeat that in English? And then, Mayor, you can do so the same as well after Dr. Treviño. Yes, definitely. Uh, in the meetings, uh, we're identifying mid and long-term solutions for Laredo's current and future healthcare needs. 
And the pandemia has shown us that we are definitely medically underserved. We have been so for many decades, but it has been really brought out with this uh, pandemic. And more so, it leads into now the situation with children. We know that Delta virus is now, the Delta variant is now affecting more children and adolescents uh, in comparison to the first wave. So we need to understand that because the school opened, we are going to have more positive cases. And of course, these cases lead into infections. We need to understand also that a lot of the places in the state are undergoing the same situation as we are. And we have been transferring children to other hospitals that have pediatric intensive care units. But we are faced with a situation that there may be a possibility at one day they will tell us they cannot take more any transfers from Laredo or from any other place. So we have to make a, a, a short term plan uh, and it's relatively urgent. And we also have to combine it with a long term plan to attend these children. Uh, the main thing that has been discussed is a pediatric intensive care unit, which involves very highly specialized uh, staff, including doctors and uh, medical personnel and nurses. Now, this is a, a situation where it requires a lot of uh, thinking, a lot of planning. Uh, this is not a simple task and requires not only the logistics of implementing equipment and specialized monitors, but also implementing the staff. And all these things have to be discussed uh, at great lengths, and we're trying to get this done in a short-term uh, situation as, as fast as we can. And the uh, discussions will be continued this Friday at a uh, continuing meeting uh, regarding the, the short and midterm solutions of Laredo's uh, healthcare needs. You know, my English version is, uh, yes, we met uh, Monday, and uh, they're with us at the meeting, uh, aside from our health team, which is basically headed by Dr. Trevino. We had uh, Chief Hurd and we had Richard Chamberlain, of course, the uh, management as well. Uh, with us was uh, also Emma Montes, uh, the CEO from, from Doctors Hospital, uh, the CEO from, uh, or the assistant uh, CEO at the time uh, uh, was Rogelio Reyes, uh, there for Jorge Lial from LMC. Uh, Dr. Ricardo Sierroa, Dr. Milton Haber, other doctors included Gladys Keane, Luis Benavides, Dr. Garza Gongora, Dr. Claire Cigarroa, and Dr. Marta Martinez. And also joining us was uh, Council Member Alisa Cigarroa. Uh, the essence was to, uh, to, to continue evaluating the immediate needs of our community. Uh, and uh, after we heard reports from uh, Nathan Rubio with uh, TDEM, basically he was very candid, and we appreciate that. A candidate he was, he basically says for us not, not, not to expect uh, a st a staffing or uh, resources by way of staffing uh, for the next uh, two weeks, possibly three or longer. Uh, and, and given also uh, the, uh, the escalating situation that, that we've, uh, we've seen uh, and we're seeing, and, and they're telling us that the apex is going to be the first or second week in September, uh, we really have no choice but to. Uh, uh, to, to institute a, an immediate plan. Uh, I'm so grateful for the uh, CEOs of, of the uh, major hospitals that stepped up and they're willing to present this plan to us this coming Friday at 10 a.m. at the airport as well. And that we expect uh, you know, to review that and, and, uh, and they can explain this uh, to the media as well if they, if they choose to do so. Uh, uh, and also a part of that meeting was, it was unanimous that uh, we definitely need to retain some sort of a consultant or a consulting group uh, to assist this community in the, uh, not only the, not necessarily the short term, well, short, mid and, and future uh, uh, needs, uh, health needs of our community. Uh, and that this uh, person needs to be very, very independent uh, given the, the fact that there's uh, private interests involved uh, just by the nature of, of how we've developed as a community uh, uh, through the private hospitals and private clinics uh, so that that was key, and we all focused uh, on that. Uh, so uh, we uh, was also discussed as to the financing of this uh, consultant. You know, the hiring of this consultant. Uh, uh, it was uh, agreed, or at least uh, you know some indication that the city could could provide half of that cost, and the county could also provide half of that cost. But of course, it it has to be approved by the appropriate uh, uh, council and and commissioners court. 
So that, that, that remains to be seen at the next uh, council meeting. Uh, and aside from that, that's generally what, what occurred. We remain uh, uh, hopeful that uh, you know, this plan will address the immediate needs and I'm, and I'm sure we will. It, it's gonna uh, hopefully you know, show us a budget as well as to see where those monies are coming from and, uh, and who's willing to commit. I know there was a, you know, uh, some understanding that the city could commit to, uh, to an intensivist, the pediatric intensivist uh, on a temporary basis but that also would have to be approved by council. Uh, so uh, that's primarily my my end of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Trevino. The next question is from Brenda Camacho and is uh, addressed to Dr. Trevino. Um, Dr. Trevino, today districts were supposed to provide their mitigation plans. Did they all provide one? Can you tell us what what, what their plans are and what are your thoughts on them, both in English and Spanish, if you could? Yes, definitely. They did provide a plan and uh, where we're looking, we're currently looking at it, but uh, we're going to have a meeting with the schools to further discuss uh, emergency measures and additional mitigations. This is, of course, to curb the level of infection in our schools and environments. But uh, yes, we are looking at the mitigation plan and uh, further discussion will be held in regards to further mitigation that may come about. En español, sí, claro, hemos recibido los planes de las escuelas y los estamos revisando. Tendremos más juntas estas semanas y, uh, para discutir las medidas de emergencia y posiblemente mitigaciones adicionales para claramente para disminu disminuir la cantidad de infección. Y eh, la junta probablemente va a ser después de esta junta y continuemos discutiendo estos uh, estos futuras mitigaciones y los planes de ellos. Thank you, Dr. Trevino. The next question is also from um, KGNS and it reads, how many of the hospitalized and ICU COVID patients are unvaccinated? I don't know if maybe Richard, do you have that information as well? That is certainly information that we can provide. I don't have it off the top of my head, but we can get back to them with that. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Alex Gano and it reads, how many children have been transferred out so far to other hospitals, if possible, the age ranges? Yeah, I may take a stab at that. At the meeting I heard and, and I stand to be corrected, I think there's been four, uh, uh, three, I think, uh, Yes, so uh, we can Richard, definitely... go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes, sorry about that, Mayor. Um, we have had um, since the beginning of the pan pandemic this year, we've had a total of five children that have been transported out. Thank you. Um, I have one more question. Um, Dr. Trevino, do you have the latest COVID positive case count from our schools or Richard? I'll jump in there too and say, as of Monday, we did have 144 pediatric cases underneath the age of um, 18 that have been reported to us collectively from both um, school districts and private schools. I might add a little bit to that, Richard. Uh, yes, uh, definitely this, uh, the number we had uh, been reported, but a combination of students and staff is uh, well over 200. Okay, thank you. I know that the other questions were more about the um, numbers uh, of the cases, which uh, Richard, you already put it on the chat. Um, those are all the questions that I have so far. Again, um, I know Brenda, we will try to get that information for you as soon as we can. Um, there, That's all the questions that I have here in the chat. So that unless anyone else has anything else uh, to provide information on, then this will conclude our media briefing for today. Thank you.